Good morning. So it turns out if you're a pastor, you have to be a quick change artist too. <laughs> they didn't tell me that in Bible college. So we're talking about a new series called His Story. What's the overarching story of God in the world? Because when you read scripture, it can seem like it's just a bunch of random stories that you're trying to find some truth in. And once you know the grand story of God, you actually begin to understand all the other stories. They start making sense. But even more than that, you begin to make sense of your own life because as it turns out, we are part of God's story. So last week we talked about a darkness that we're not afraid of, and that's part of the problem. And today, I want to talk to you about why religion doesn't work. And you're probably wondering, well, why would you talk about a topic like that since we're like in a church? And um, what I'd like to start with is that actually one of the most vocal critics of organized religion that ever lived was Jesus. And it wasn't that he was opposed to people pursuing God in community. He just recognized what could go wrong when people did that. And what I want you to know is that we are susceptible to those same things. If, if we don't know what those things are, we can get pulled into them without knowing. There's a, there's a gravitational effect of these things on every human heart. And so God has given us some insight in his word about this. And so we're just going to process this morning, why does religion not work, and then what, are, what is the thing that makes all the difference? And uh, I'd like to begin in Isaiah, the, the um, uh, 29th chapter, verse 13. The Lord says, these people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. People are doing religious looking and religious sounding things. But there is no connection with God. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they have been taught. Therefore, once more, I will astound these people with wonder upon wonder. The wisdom of the wise will perish and the intelligence of the intelligent will vanish. Woe to those who go to great depths to hide their plans from the Lord. It, doesn't that seem strange to you that they're drawing near to God at least with their rituals and their routines and yet they're hiding things from God? He said they hide their plans from the Lord who do their work in darkness and think, who sees us? Who will know? You turn things upside down as if the potter were thought to be like the clay. Like the potter is the one that forms the clay, but now people think they can form God. Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, you did not make me? Can the pot say to the potter, you know nothing? Well, that's a powerful passage of scripture. And uh, what I would like to say is that I'm aware that in our world, there's an increasing number of voices now that say religion is the main problem in the world. That because of terrorist acts where people do things in the name of whatever God it is that they choose to follow, that this is part of what's wrong with our world. And, uh, and even if you don't think religion is the biggest problem in the world, there are lots of people who say religion isn't exactly working. It's, it's not accomplishing what it's supposed to. So what is going on? And what we want to do is examine the things that, that we're all susceptible to. Like, I'm not talking about other people, other places. I want us to think about this so that we don't get pulled into something that winds up separating us from God while we look like we're paying close attention to him. And the first thing is this, religion may start out as seeking God, but it usually turns into using God. See? People get interested in the concept of God, and they get interested in learning the metaphysical realities of God, and they get interested in the truths that he has uh, dispersed and revealed. But over time, it, it turns into something else. It's very easy to start coming to places like this and be all about wanting to learn about God. And then over time, something happens, and we start wanting to, to use God. For example, if, if you're a parent, you probably have had an experience with one of your children where, where they, they did something they shouldn't do, and their conscience was bothering them, so they left little clues so that you would find out. Maybe they even came right out and told you. And then there was some level of punishment. Maybe they got grounded. Maybe they weren't allowed to play video games, whatever it was. And, and then they felt better. 
because they, they had the, their conscience was bothered and now they got some kind of punishment and they feel better. And there are people who do this to God all the time. In fact, some people will intentionally gravitate towards stricter religious climates so that when people speak harshly to them, they will feel as though that's some form of punishment and they feel like, okay, now I've, I've kind of paid for my sin. And here's the problem with that kind of uh, approach to God is that we feel better, but we don't get better. See, some people just use God to kind of sear or soothe their conscience. And this is a really risky approach. So their behavior might uh, really doesn't change, but they feel better about it. There's another way that people can use God. And they can use God to medicate themselves. Now, in our culture, we are saturated with self-medication options. I mean, just all the ways we can distract and numb ourselves from the things we don't like or would prefer weren't happening or things that we wish were happening. I mean, just it's unbelievable how much is available to us. You can live most of your life in a distracted or numb condition. That's the way our world is. What I want you to know is that it's very easy in religious environments for us to stand up and say, well, they shouldn't be doing that. Well, first of all, we are they. The second thing is, is that there are people who use God to do the same thing. They want some kind of a feeling so that they feel better, but they actually don't deal with the issues that they should be giving attention to in their life. So they kind of, they, they, they want to feel numb or they just want to feel relieved. Or, or maybe we come together and, and if you've ever been in a room where people are worshiping God, you just kind of get elevated. It feels good. and say, Oh, that's great. And that is great. But it's not great if we use that as an excuse to not deal with the issues in our life or in our world. Um, sometimes we'll just seek a religious feeling so that we can ignore the other things that matter. And, and that, is, that is unhealthy. Like God will call us on that. And so we have to be careful not to use God in that way. Sometimes people will, will do hurtful things or sinful things, and then they'll come to church, and maybe they'll drop a little extra money in the offering. A lot of people live on the balance approach, as long as the good outweighs the bad. Well, here's what you should know. There's almost no one who thinks that their good doesn't outweigh their bad. Like even serial killers. So... Like, we can't, we can't trust our own assessment of that. That's not a good system. This doesn't work well for us. So how do we learn to do this? Because some people come in, maybe, maybe they'll make a contribution or they'll serve in some capacity or, or maybe just by being there, they feel like this, this counts as some action of righteousness. And so what are they doing? They're using God. They're using God. I want to be able to get away with the stuff I do and as long as I do something good or participate in some noble cause or contribute in some way, it offsets that. They're using God. And then there are people who use God to get what they really want in life. See, a lot of times people want God, but a lot of times they just want God to get them what they really want. And uh, so th th this, this is really intriguing because you can always find out if this is true about someone when they don't get what they really want. So there's some, let's, let's suppose you're here this morning and you're single and for all the world you want a spouse. A pastor one time told me that, that marriage is like flies on a screen door. Some want in and some want out. And <laughs> so, you know, so, but... You know, I want to get married. I want to get so, so, so they'll start showing up in church and serving. They just, they just want God to give them a, a spouse. And you know what? If you get that spouse, at least for a while, you'll think that is really, really good. But what if, what if you don't get a spouse? Or let's suppose you start attending church because you, you, you were hoping that maybe if you say enough prayers or show up in enough times in a place like this, that somehow it, it magically opens a door so you can get the college you want or the job you want or whatever it is. And here's the real risk in that. By the way, I believe it's perfectly legitimate to ask God for things. But here's how we know we're drifting a little bit. When we don't get what we ask for, we either feel really guilty 
I must not have given enough. I must not have sacrificed enough. I must not have tried hard enough. I must not be good enough. And so we just try all the harder. That's a really, guilt is a horrible way to try to process your life. It just doesn't work. And then there's another side to that, and that is where we get resentful. We get angry with God because we didn't get what we wanted. And so we say things like, then I quit. I, I'm not doing this whole church thing, this whole religious thing. What, what good is it? I did what I was supposed to do, and God didn't do what I wanted him to. Do, do you see the problem there? The problem there is that we're using God. The problem there is in that scenario, God doesn't really get to direct our life. We're directing our life, and we're using him to make it happen. And this is a really risky thing to do. Now, I've heard people say, well, you know, if, if, I don't, if someone asks God for something and they don't get what they want, that'll crush their faith, and, and they won't believe in God anymore. That is not true. I have two children who I have said no to a lot of times in their lives. And not once did they ever look at me and go, I don't even know if I can believe you're real. Because <laughs> you didn't get me what I'm, I don't even know if you're real. No, that, the problem was that I was real and I was saying no. They wished I wasn't real right then. But see, this idea that, that if we don't get what we want, it creates a crisis of faith. No, if we don't get what we want, it often reveals whether we're just trying to use God or if we're actually pursuing God. There's a real world of difference between those two things. So uh, it's really uh, important to know. By the way, lots of people try to create the God that they want. Have you ever heard someone who started their conversation about God like this? Well, I think God, and then they just fill in the blank. Well, what's the source of their information? Because like our imagination is not necessarily the model of all doctrine and truth. And by the way, our comfort is not necessarily a good tool to discern what is true. So we need a better system than that. And so we have to be really careful we're not just using God. Religion may start out to learn about God, but usually turns into comparing ourselves with others. This is another huge risk we run in following God. We originally want, we want to learn all we can about God and, and how to live a healthy life and, and, and how to, to be a, the kind of person that, that reflects who he is and what he's about. But there's this little thing that happens over time. We start looking at others, and here's the thing. You can always find someone who just isn't keeping up with you. Right? You can always find that person who's not as strong as you are, whose weaknesses are a little bit more obvious than yours, who, who, who just, they don't seem to be as healthy as you are. And, so, and, and this is what we say, it's so easy to do. Well, you know, if they would just try harder, if they would just do what I have done, what's going on there? This is no longer about God. This is about us comparing with someone else. And most of the time, we try to find someone who's not doing as well, because we just feel better. Have you ever noticed when people, like in, in the wintertime or in the spring, they take a vacation to some warm and sunny climate, how often they post on social media what the weather is, and then they have some kind of little sick, sarcastic, snide remark to say about all of us who are still suffering in the snow. What's that about? Why, why do we do things like that? It's even more enjoyable if I'm in 82 degree weather and it's sunny as if I know there are people who are digging out of a snowstorm. I just feel better. That is not a good thing about us. It's not. We should think about that. So there's this tendency that we have. We start comparing ourselves with others and Paul calls us on it in scripture. Look at what he says in Romans 2. You, therefore, have no excuse, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge another, you are condemning yourself, because you who pass judgment do the, what's the last two words? And you know what we think? I do not. I do not. That's the point. That's the point I'm making, except it's actually not true. We often do the very same things 
We just do it in different environments or in ways that we have a reason why, well, well, I know it looks the same, but it's not. It's actually very different. My situation is very different. Uh, this, this is a huge problem for us. See, you, you can always find someone who's a little bit worse. Not only that, you can always find someone who's a little bit better off. Like, I don't know who the person is who has the most, but I don't think they're here today. And if you are, I need to see you right after the service. Because like, we got some projects you could help us with. But if you look at people who have more, it is so easy to start getting resentful. We even accuse them of bending the rules or breaking the rules because we think, I've tried as hard as they have, and they've got more, they must have cheated the system somehow. It's just who they know. And this comparison game is really just a trap to draw us in. And the tendency is to accuse others of things. This is what Paul says, of things that we actually do. This is one of the observations I have made in my life through a lot of years in ministry. And that is when you hear someone who's railing against a specific sin, what I have discovered is that in many cases, that is the very sin they are most susceptible to surrendering to. Their railing is more about trying to convince themselves than anything that's going on. By the way, there's another truth, and that is a lot of times when you see religious people who want to create rules in the environment, so it's not just, I think God has called me to live this way, I think everybody ought to live this way. The reason people often try to create those rules for everybody is because they want to eliminate the temptation that they know they're so susceptible to. And instead of humbly acknowledging, I have a weakness in that area, they try to eliminate it from the environment through rules and laws and codes. And this is a really unhealthy way to approach life. So that's another way. So we can wind up just, just trying to compare ourselves with others all the time. This is really unhealthy. There's another way that religion, we can, we can kind of get sucked into and gravitate towards, and it's in all of our hearts. This can happen to any one of us. Religion may start out attempting to please God, but usually turns into pleasing people or pleasing ourselves. You know, you just, it's, it, when you get that pat on the back, well, you know, so, like, you, you start showing up in places like this, and someone, oh, it's so good to see you again. And, you know, and we like having you on, and that's really good. And then, like, you make some, some corrections in your life. Oh, that is so good. We're so proud of you. And, and then, then you do some things, or you serve in some, oh, that is so good. And, and we find ourselves not just wanting to help, but wanting to get that little pat on the back. And like, I don't think, I, I've, I've heard religious leaders say, we don't pat anybody on the back because we don't want anybody's head to get big. Um, I don't think that's really the risk we run. I don't think expressing appreciation is, puts a person at risk. But I think there's something in our heart where we become approval addicts. And this is the thing about being an approval addict. You will do whatever it takes to get approval. And here's the thing. Like this, this happens a lot in, uh, uh, we, we see this when, when uh, hi, high school graduates go off to college, okay? So this, this is kind of how this works. They've been in an environment where they've done all the right things, and in fact, they've been so applauded for it. Like this is such an example of a Christian young man or a Christian young woman. What a great example. And we applaud them for it, and then, they go away to college, and it's like the wheels come off the bus, and they start doing all this stuff, and you go, what happened? They changed. No, they didn't. If you are an approval addict in a religious environment, you will do whatever you can to get the approval from religious people. And when you are in a non-religious environment, you will do whatever you can to get the approval of non-religious people. The person didn't change at all, just their environment did. That's the risk. And so we, we, and, and we empower people, like they can control our lives by the approval they give or the approval they withhold. This is a terrifying thing. Like th there are people who are living, it's not their life. It's not their life. I, I did a wedding one time uh, many, many years ago and everybody who was at that rehearsal remembers it to this day. 
because that rehearsal was something else. The mother of the bride decided she had a plan for what this wedding should look like. And the bride and I had already discussed the plan for the wedding. And I didn't know that the mother of the bride was going to try to sabotage and recreate this whole thing into the image of what she liked. And she was going to use the pressure of the moment while everybody was there. And so we started the rehearsal, and her hand went up. I don't get a lot of that in wedding rehearsals. <laughs> I'm going, yes? And, and she said, don't you think it would be really nice if? And then she described what's supposed to happen next. And I said, no. <laughs> what I didn't know is that no one says no to her. And there was a collective gasp that went up in the room. When I said no, she went, everyone went, <gasps> and you know, I'm fairly oblivious, but when everybody gasps, I do notice that. <laughs> and so we started on a little bit, and, and, and just like a minute later, hand goes up again. And I said, yes. And she said, don't you think it would be nice if we, and I said, no. More gasping. People are starting to hyperventilate. <laughs> like, I've seen people pass out at weddings. I've never seen anybody pass out at a, a rehearsal. And so, so I looked at her and I said, I said, ma'am, this is not a planning session. It's a practice session. The plans have already been made. Now we are going to practice what we have planned. And that was the last objection that I got from her. And about, oh, I don't know, 23 years later, she finally talked to me again. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so what makes a mother think that this is her wedding? What, what makes anybody think that we can control other people's lives? And if you have the unmitigated gall to indicate that, that like, this is your life and you actually want to live it, there are, that's a real litmus test for how controlling people around you can be. And this is something we have to think about. Because if you are an approval addict, you will surrender your identity and the control of your life and you will resent the very people who are controlling it. And you would like to believe that it's all their fault, and that's the easy belief. And what I want you to know is it's not their fault. It's your fault. You're not standing up and speaking for yourself. And, and where do we learn this kind of thing? We can learn this kind of thing in church. Th this is not good. So we want to try to avoid this idea where we're trying to please people or please ourselves. And by the way, this is another thing. Have you ever noticed how often and frequent that people believe that there is a coincidence that both they and God actually have the same preferences on things. <laughs> have you noticed that? Like when it comes to worship, there are some people who just believe that God loves the pipe organs and the traditional worship. He just does. And then there are some people who believe, well, God loves the contemporary worship and all the the band instruments. He just does. Isn't it amazing that you think God likes best what you like best? And we don't just do this on music styles. We do this on speaking styles. We do this on, on how you set up the room. I mean, there are some people who would come into a room like this and go, yeah, this is not a church. There's no stained glass. What, what, we, we, what did the drummer do? We put him in a box, you know? Just, <laughs> why would we do that? It's just, this is... You know, I've, I've been in St. Peter's Church at, in, in Rome, and it's, it is a stunning church. It's, it's built in the shape of a cross, and at the intersection of the cross is a dome that was designed by Mike, Michelangelo. And to give you a sense of how big that church is and how tall that dome is, you can put the Statue of Liberty underneath that dome and its torch will not touch the top. Well, that's what a real church is. <laughs> it's our preference. We always impose. It's, nobody just says, well, that's just my preference. We always think we can get our way if it happens to be God's preference too. Do you see the risk of that? Because it's, it's a real challenge. 
and we have to learn how to get past this. So what's the solution? And the solution is religion ends where relationship begins. That God's intention was not to create a rule-oriented envi environment where people just became compliant little robots and said the right things at the right time and then just lived their life like they wanted to anyway. He wants a relationship. And folks, if you've ever been in a real relationship, it will challenge you at every level of your being. But it's very different because the goal of the person in the relationship shouldn't be to control you, but for you to become all that you can be, to experience life to the full. See, this is what Jesus said. The thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that you might have life to the full. Look at how Jesus says it in Revelation, the third chapter. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. It's a call to relationship. It's a call to breaking bread together. It's a call to conversation. God came and walked and talked with Adam and Eve. And after they violated, they, they chose rules, the knowledge of good and evil over relationship. And then when God came, they just ran away and hid. Jesus comes into humanity. God's coming back to, to, to reunite this relationship. And what did they do? They respond in anger and they beat the life out of him. What did he do that deserved death? He relieved suffering and healed sickness. He fed the hungry. When people were around him, they began to understand their past. They began to have meaning in their present and hope for their future. What was it that demanded the death penalty? And what demanded the death penalty is that relationship exposes religious environments for what they truly Truly are, and there's nothing more deadly to a religious environment than a leave, living, breathing relationship with the living God and with each other. And this is what God calls us to. So, if if we pursue relationship, does that mean that God will never challenge us? Of course, He will challenge us, but for very different reasons. I don't know if you realize, but all kinds of people show up in places like this. I know we all have. We look like we have our act together right now. And most people can hold it together for about an hour. That's why our services are about an hour. Because <laughs> like, we don't want to press the limits. At an hour and a half, people start wigging out, and then we see the real them. You know, Just, We don't do that. So, but if, if, if the most important thing to us is our reputation in the community, that, that only people who live in wise and healthy ways, the kind of people that we would be proud of, if those are the only people that's in the room, then, then we have to decide what we're going to do when other people come in the room. And you know what the easiest thing to do is? To talk in such harsh and belittling terms that they realize they're not welcome. Their lives are not changed. They just don't create a complex situation for us to deal with anymore. And that's not relationship. When, when you decide you want a relationship with God? It's not just a, a one-way reality. The love of God, when it begins to flow into us, begins to flow through us, and then we want everyone we connect with to have their best life possible too. And once you understand that, that God didn't come just to give a bunch of rules. So what about the Ten Commandments? Ten Commandments are really important, but if you misunderstand them, you don't understand that they're about relationship, and you think that it's just about rules, you will misread the Bible. And people misread God all the time. The reason he has come is because he wants a relationship with us. And of course, he's going to challenge us on the unhealthy things, but it's not because he's embarrassed about us or because he's too proud to be around us. It's because he wants the best for us. And that makes all the difference in the world. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um, maybe you're here today and you're kind of on the, the rule side of things. Like you go through the motions and, and you actually feel pretty good about it. It's, it's not too much of a burden for you to bear. And, I mean, you can do that. You can do it for a long time. But there's so much more that God intends for you to experience. 
He didn't come just to tell you how to live. He came to live in you. And he didn't just come so that you would look at others and assess whether you're better or less than them. He came so that you would look at others and you would love them. Until you know this truth, the Bible can appear like God is all about the rules and judgment. But once you know this truth, it changes everything you read in there. So, Father, help us today. Our hearts gravitate towards this going through the motions and mouthing certain words. And that's not good for any relationship, especially our relationship with you. Would you help us keep drawing our hearts towards you, knowing that you are always there for us? In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together.